various uh, continents and the rise of immigration and the way we integrate and assimilate society and how we inculturate the culture of minorities towards the mainstream society. We think the landscape under which we view minor- minority groups has significantly and astronomically changed throughout the years. Therefore, we say it is high time that minority groups should be able to advocate for the widespread use of their cultural practices as opposed to defending the very core of cultural appropriation instead of calling out celebrities, for example, such as Adele or Katy Perry with the views of cultural appropriation. Our goal is simple. We want to forward the idea of social cohesion among individuals, particularly minorities in the mainstream society where they live in because we think that the continuous call out on cultural appropriation significantly propagates the idea of an us versus them narrative instead of moving forward to a community where we are we where we can coexist harmoniously why is this the problem and why is the idea of an us versus them narrative existing under opposition's model fundamentally problematic. Two reasons. Number one, because this led to the creation of a narrative that people ought not to have forced interactions because they have polarizing differences in terms of identities. This is why the discrimination across broad indices such as workforce, for example, exists in status quo. This is not to say that this is the only reason behind that problem, but what we say, the propagation of this narrative contributes heavily to that problem. But secondly, this is also this has also led to the segregation in terms of identities because interactions are always predicated on the idea that we are different because we highlight our different instead of our highlighting our own similarities. We therefore say that the cultural appropriation as a defense in terms of call out, for example, is grand and expositionary, leading to more problematic views in status quo, such as name calling in celebrities, such as Adele, for example, where people called her out or as disgusting, as problematic, which creates tension and rifts in the way we view minorities and how we ought to forward cohesion among our society. Therefore, the first discussion is this idea that minority groups should be able to welcome other individuals, such as white people, for example, in trying out a variety of their cultural practices, such as uh, artistic expressions through dances, through rituals, for example, and even cultural uh, uh, markers or cultural artifacts, such as fashion, such as weaving, for example, or hairdresses, because this is how we open up discussion on shared identity and collective understanding of what culture ought to be. I'll take you later. So what, when we talk about these forms of advocacy, we, we welcome the use of culture through its integration in the mainstream society, such as popular cultural discourses, such as media, for example, or even music videos. Videos. But this does not to say that we're not going to defend things like forwarding awareness campaigns or education because we think these are fundamentally important in supporting the idea of people utilizing their culture. So we do not support the idea of individuals lambasting the existence of this culture to begin with because again, there are demarcation and limits to the way people utilize cultural practices. But going to that extent, we're willing to defend edu- educating this individual. So the question is, why do we think this is important in forwarding greater understanding and appreciation of culture, particularly to minorities? Because number one, the first reason is it forwards the idea of cultural validation. And why is this fundamentally important? Because when we talk about the existence or the integration of these practices in the mainstream society, we are then imprinting our own culture in the collective consciousness because as a person of color or as a, as a minority you ought to validate and legitimate your experience because that's the only way for you to be able to share your identity to the rest of the world to the legitimacy of that existence to begin with so in a mainstream society where people have a homogeneous culture that idea of trying to imprint your cultural practice or in trying to imprint your idea, idea is how you make sure that you are part of that ident- that you are part of that society to begin with. But the second reason to this is that this is how we maximize understanding and education towards the different perspective that the outsiders forward. This is where we allow them to have first-hand experience, meaning making our culture practice more accessible to the general public and trying to forward more experiences. And why is that experience important? Because under their side, we live in a world where we gatekeep such culture and that people do not have an incentive to be able to understand and educate themselves. Because we think the main motivation as to how people understand culture is if they get to experience that culture to begin with. Because that's how they are able to spark their curiosity and ignite questions to be able to 
fully understand what the holistic understanding of that culture. But the third reason to this is because we have to understand that there are minority cultures who are already being left out in society. And the only way for us to protect them is if there is a necessary precondition of awareness towards individuals. Because that awareness is what allows them to be able to mobilize in protecting that culture to begin with. That's how they're able to understand what the significance of that culture is. And that's important in trying to make sure that that culture is protected and ensure that that culture can go on for generations and centuries to begin with. So this argumentation is simply important in forwarding understanding and appreciation. I'll take closing if they have. Closing. So the problem with your argument is it is predicated upon the notion that this culture will not be shared in some form. What side opposition has to defend in this debate is not a circumstance in which minority groups can't share their culture, but a circumstance in which majoritarian groups can't independently access that culture. Okay, right. So I'm going to uh, like disprove that idea in the second discussion because we understand that there are problems in terms of that utilization of that culture because majority often the majority values often co of that use of that culture. So the question is, how do we check and balance the forwarding of these cultures to begin with? We think the way to check and balance the discourse of that culture is when we allow that culture to thrive in the mainstream society and be integrated in the collective consciousness of people. Because the way, because if you take a look at it, cultural practices derive more, prow more power with its utilization when people see value and when people see utility in that culture. Because that's how we expand that culture to begin with. And that's how we're able to integrate that and enrich the cultural appreciation. At least under our side, we are able to uh, counter check and balance the different discourses of that culture and react into which is the most legitimate form of the use of that culture and try to mitigate possible problems that can exist under their side. Thanks. Uh, before we move ahead, I just uh, I, I just want to say that I'm being sporadically dropped out of Zoom at every other minute. Uh, so before we move ahead, just wait for me for a couple of seconds so that I can refresh and join Zoom again. Uh, but before I leave, I'd like to assure the Prime Minister and opening government that I have brought the broad strokes of their argument down and they shouldn't really worry. Uh, before we move ahead, just give me a second. I'll just reconnect with Zoom and just wait for me. Guys, just to make sure we're still waiting for the adjudicator to come back, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're still waiting. Sweet. Um, um, additionally, uh, Rohan, can you keep time uh, through the chat box and not share your screen? Because I think that's putting a load on my bandwidth. If everybody is okay with that, if every speaker is okay with that. Yeah, of course, no problem. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd now like to invite the leader of opposition for their speech here. Here. Um, hello, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Hey, oh, just give me a second. I'm so sorry. Let me just set up my. Oh, uh, yeah, you may begin. All right, I'm starting my speech in three, two, one. 
there is a special and unique connection between oneself and their culture. And it's that when you're born into a world that dehumanizes you and gives you a culture that no matter how hard you try, just feels alien from you, something that is uniquely yours and something that you yourself exclusively own is sometimes a very good thing that comes and gives the necessary grounding for individuals to feel like they're human, to feel like they're valuable. And I think in the world of opening government, they have made a fatal flaw in assuming that cultural appropriation occurs with, with positive and altruistic incentive structures, thus why all of their benefits can occur. I think the stance coming from opening opposition with regards to this is quite simple. We do not support uh, embracing cultural appropriation for two things. The first, we need to have a retention of some forms of power and galvanization within minority groups. We think that focusing on cultural appropriation is oftentimes the best way to do so. But number two, even when dealing with individuals such as white individuals who really want to wear a sari, for instance, we think that actively focusing on cultural appropriation is the best way to combat them. Before I move into my argumentation, I just have a couple of things to say about the Prime Minister's speech. The entire case is predicated on one particular premise, that awareness equates a good type of interpretation for minorities. So let me first talk about awareness, right? Like, firstly, I don't think the Prime Minister proves that awareness is something that is exclusive to the extent that we need to embrace cultural appropriation for it, right? I think it's blatantly false. The fact that we live in a world right now where cultural appropriation is particularly very contentious and it hasn't been embraced as a norm yet, yet people still have high levels of awareness with regards to distinction between culture suggests that at best, the argumentation of awareness is neutral. But the next level, even if there is an increase in the scale of awareness with regards to differing versions of cultures, I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, is this increase in awareness actually a good thing, right? Because I think the premise from the prime minister is that they assume that all forms of cultural appropriation occur in contexts that are legitimate, fair, and also respectable to most cultures. I don't think this is true. Firstly, for it to be appropriation, it means actively extracting these things from cultural contexts. Right? This is why white individuals, for instance, have completely sanitized the hijab, something that is actively very meaningful to a lot of Muslim women around the world, but is now being reduced into like a simple shawl or a scarf that you just wear to look fashionable. Right? The point is, awareness is not a benefit if it means that you have to clear up further misconceptions and further problems that individuals or majorities, because they are not caring for your sensitivities, do. They want discussions. They want people to res be, res be respectable. But how do you do that if you don't draw lines, if you don't draw parallels and boundaries to when majorities cannot cross cultural lines? The only way you do that is by drawing very clear lines that individuals shouldn't cross. That's where cultural appropriation comes in. That's where you know what is acceptable and whatnot. Because in the world of government, it's just a free-for-all for white individuals and people in power to take culture. They do, They have completely like underestimated the sheer amount of power these people have. They have power in terms of money, like political representation and their numbers as well. They don't need to be altruistic and they won't be altruistic for the reasons that I've suggested already. Now, let me move into my argumentation. Why is this particularly a bad thing for groups? Let me first talk about the first level. What does this advocacy look like and what exactly are the harms of this. The first thing is that for groups to start advocating for cultural appropriation, we first need to recognize that the discussion is currently dominated by white individuals, right? People who actively defend cultural appropriation are individuals who are oftentimes at the receiving end of anger. And oftentimes the ways in which they justify cultural appropriation is not that they appreciate culture. Maybe that's true, but it's oftentimes laden with narratives such as minorities are just a bit too sensitive. These are There are issues out there that are a lot bigger. There are issues out there that are a lot larger. There are also things like no individual should have complete control of a culture. And no matter what type of narrative you pick and choose, the usage of this type of wording from individuals who defend cultural appropriation is one that's inherently harmful to minorities already. Because no matter which version you pick and choose, you are inherently dehumanizing or delegitimizing the very valid concerns of actual minorities on the ground. So the first thing is that the inherent advocacy of it is already in and of itself an inherent problem because you embolden really negative problems that minorities have been trying to fight for a really long time. We have tried so hard to be taken seriously only for you now to embolden a narrative that we're apparently too sensitive about the way we look. That's a net harm on the world 
of government. Secondly, they assume that these minority groups are like a monolith that everyone agrees to cultural appropriation, right? You can begin the advocacy, but that doesn't mean the groups and the people you're dealing with are actually going to be very supportive of this, right? I actually think it's going to be the opposite, and there's going to be a lot of splintering within minority groups. The reason for this is because this is the widespread usage of your culture. This means taking Aboriginal statues in Australia and possibly placing them in malls, or even using hijab as a mainstream fashion symbol outside of Islamic context, right? Given how closely connected this is to a lot of people, it is definitely going to spark major instances of anger, and this sparks individuals and gives incentive for minority groups to further splinter and reduce their uniformity in terms of the way that they are able to oppose white individuals. So the two things I've proven so far is this, your advocacy is inherently quite negative. Number two, you also anger minority groups. So I don't know why losing them is valuable if it means these individuals are trying to advocate have negative incentive structures. But before that, CG, you have a POI? Yeah, so you say that we derive utility from our culture solely because it's uniquely ours. As an Indian, if I practice yoga, do I lose the utility I get from yoga because a white person is practicing beer yoga or like goat yoga? No, you don't. But you do the moment they turn into weird stuff like pizza yoga and goat yoga, right? There are all kinds of weird examples of when white people take cultures, use it for their own benefit and have a good time from there, leaving people like me and you behind, right? Now, let me go with the comparison. Let's deal with the anger of white individuals. So the first thing I want to say is, obviously, I acknowledge white people will be quite angry when we call them out, right? But I think the first question you've got to ask ourselves here is, is this anger actually palpable and so potent to the point where it's harmful? I don't think it is. The reason is because we're living in an era where capitalism has aligned itself with liberalism to the extent that many corporate companies have introduced stuff like human resources and are very, very strict in the way in which that their employees are behaving, right? All it takes is one message to one HR manager on LinkedIn to get someone fired. All it takes is one tweet to get people fired as well. I think the fact that even Adele, someone so powerful with so much money, had to apologize for the Jamaican bridge she was wearing suggests there is significant power in the ways in which we are able to monopolize and also deal with individuals. With this particular context in mind, they may be angry, yes, but the narrative of cultural appropriation is so potent and powerful to the point where their anger just cannot manifest itself in meaningful ways because there's a cost to cultural appropriation. There's a cost to it. So even if you're angry, these people don't speak. They don't actively come out. And at best, if they're angry, they get fired and we're able to hold them accountable for this. For those reasons, we need to defend ourselves. Thank you. I'd like to thank the leader of opposition for their speech and I'll invite the deputy prime minister for their speech. Here, here. Hi, uh, I'm Belle. PPM, are you she or they? If you have POIs, you can just chat. I'll take one before six. I think that opening opposition is banking on something so intangible. They said that we have to have that kind of grasp on our culture because we have to have that kind of like control on it without proving why that is such an important value in comparative to the values that my prime minister presented to you. I'm going to have three points of rebuttal for the first speaker. First, let's talk about awareness. They said that the awareness on culture exists on both sides. But Farley told you that we only heighten awareness when we remove the the atmosphere of hostility against the majority culture. When we remove that notion that, no, you cannot be in this discussion because this is something that we own. We said that we increase that when we let them try out our culture and give them more incentive to actually listen and to actually want to learn these things because these things are already accessible to them. They said that we have to draw a particular line. I question the value on actually drawing this particular line, right? I agree with CG when they said that, you know, it does not harm how you use your particular culture when somebody else uses it, even at the extent that they do weird things on it, like, for example, in yoga. I think that drawing a line on something just gives or like heightens the us versus them narrative in telling people that this is something that you cannot cross. This is something that is only accessible to ours. I think that the biggest harm you get from that 
is the notion that, you know, us as white people, you also cannot cross this line. We also have a line. And right now, we're when we're living in a globalized world where a lot of people are already interacting, we have to have a good relationship between these cultures. When we tell people that there is no line, we should live in a shared culture. We should live peacefully, peacefully and better, right? Secondly, they said that you only splinter minority groups when you do this. First, in status quo, the minority groups are already splintered because like what you said, cultural appropriation is not something that is agreed upon by the society. That's why when the Adele issue came out, a lot of black people defended her and told everyone that there's no harm in Adele using the hair weave and wearing the Jamaican flag. A lot of these people don't agree on one particular thing. But why is it better on OG? It's because we give you a particular benefit that lessens the, the thought of minority culture that they are being attacked or that they are being victimized. Farley discussed to you how we better protect the culture and how we better extend the understanding from the majority culture when we do this. Lastly, they said that white people are not actually going to get angry that bad, right? But we say there's still a certain level of microaggression that you develop because you, in, you ingrain on their minds that this is something that will always be about them and it cannot be shared, right? That's why a lot of people justify the us versus them narrative with the use of cultural appropriation by saying that we can never be mixed because there are things that that there are things that we can never agree on and these people don't actually want to welcome us, right? So we think that even if it's not on the extents of them like hurting someone, I think that the microaggression still heavily affects people in their workplace and in their school. I also think that the whole issue of cultural appropriation stems from the fact that minority groups do not want their culture to be taken as a joke. They want people to be able to recognize that a simple hairdress or clothing brings so much story from their past. They believe that when people have a better understanding of these nuances, they're able to understand the gravity of the suffering the Africans face in the past. They don't gatekeep because they feel like their culture should be untouchable. We gatekeep because we are scared that white people will take our culture lightly without any knowledge of our past. How we solve that in opening government? Farley proved to you that you only particularly bridge this gap when you welcome all these things, right? We posit that we, well, that we only maximize education and appreciation of our history when we get to welcome other people. When we're able to tell them that our culture is very rich and full of story, you are free to use it and appreciate it, and we welcome you. This way, a lot more people are welcome to listen, to understand, and engage in discussion. I think that this is a very, very important value because right now, those people that do not care about culture or do not respect the culture of the minority came from areas that do not really care about these discussions because for so long, they have been gatekept and told that you don't belong in this discussion. You only solve that when you bridge this particular gap. What happens in opposition side? When you gate keep your culture and tell people that, no, you can't wear that. You create an atmosphere of hostility and you only heighten this us versus them narrative. I'll take a POI before from OO, sure. OO, right? Did I, did I hear that? Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, so the argumentation on why the narrative of us versus them is neutralized doesn't quite work because minorities still feel a lot of resentment when they feel like culture is being taken away from them, especially when they cannot control the context it's used in. Given that, why is your argument still valuable? First, I don't think that there is a resentment because people are taking culture from them. There is a resentment because they sometimes feel like their culture is not being understood fully. That's why a lot of Black people actually defended Adele because they feel like Adele already have that particular knowledge. So you solve that on our side. When we assure these minority groups that they are not being lambasted, that these white people actually better understand this their culture this way. What's the second benefit that we offer you? And this is also a reply to your POI. We ultimately maximize the extent of protection and preservation of the culture when we don't gatekeep at all. Like what Prime Minister said, some minority cultures are having a hard time preserving their culture or making it last longer. Why? Because of racism. Because they don't want to hear their they don't want to wear their headdress or their weaves because they are scared of being vilified or seen as different. How do we solve that? 
we correct this notion when we normalize the existence of these images in the society. When we tell people that this is not something very wild, this actually represents a very, very rich culture and history. When other people also see white people wearing dreadlocks or wearing particular clothing that used to be exclusive to minorities, we normalize that image, thus giving more incentive to minority groups and other people to preserve it better. Lastly, we protect the culture more when you give incentive for white people to be able to care, to do something, and to be able to preserve it. Because now, this is not only about them, but this is also about us, our shared culture that we want to protect because we're able to understand that this is something that is deeply rooted to our history. I think that these are exclusive benefits that you cannot get in a world where minority groups continuously gatekeep and tell people that this is where I draw the line. You cannot engage in this particular thing because it is our culture. We better protect them in opening government. Thank you. I thank the DLO, the DPM for her speech. I now invite DLO for their speech. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me clearly? I can, yes. Thank you. In opening opposition, we don't dispute that there is value in being nice to white people. Perhaps they are going to be a little bit kinder to you when you're less in their face. Perhaps they are going to be a little bit more understanding of you if you are going to stop scolding them for the ways in which they engage destructively with your culture. These are all literally non-contentious because these are just benefits of people who, benefits of you just being nice to the people who do anything generally in wrong. And you just refuse in principle to acknowledge what they're doing wrong and confront them for all those wrongdoings. It is at this specific juncture that we tell you in opening opposition that we are happy to forego all these, I guess, positive responses that white people are likely going to have towards your culture if it comes at the specific painful expense of having to give up the unique culture that is yours to give up and continually see that culture of yours be bastardized by white people that you have given license to to do the atrocities that they are likely going to continue. If anything thus far has been a like a case study to, to see what white people can do if you give them some semblance of agency agency to play with your culture, we aren't happy with the evidence that we have seen thus far. We are happy to remain defensive and stop white people or any majority group from having access to minority groups unpetitedly without having to turn to these groups for agency, to turn to these groups for licenses on how and exactly when they ought to use these cultures. I have three responses that I want to get out of the way before I talk about one broad argumentation with regards to why we think the, uh, the, the process of holding majorities accountable through fighting for things like call cultural appropriation and defense ending there is the only check and balance mechanism that allows minorities to live a dignified life in society and why every other check and balance mechanism in society has failed in the spine and why we ought to on every front champion this. Um, responses before that. The first response that I want to engage with, which literally is the premise of the entirety of the opening government's case, is this idea that the only way in which majority groups are able to appreciate and accept you is through using your culture and when they use your culture, they see aha, there is value and therefore you are legitimate as a minority group. This is the verbatim analysis that I heard come up from the Prime Minister, which was echoed by the Deputy Prime Minister. I have three responses to this. The first thing I want to respond to is, I think you can still associate cultures with people without necessarily having to use that culture to see that there is value in that culture. So for example, I think sharing a culture isn't necessarily a prerequisite for you to know that a culture is owned by a specific group and has value for that specific group. So for example, you still have minorities that are using their culture publicly. In fact, we argue to you that in a world where you fight for cultural appropriation, it is a world where people who are minorities minorities are more willing to defend their cultures and be proud of those cultures as well because you're now engaging and more engrossed in this discussion of defending your culture. That is the same world where you also have Kendrick Lamar creating music videos like All The Stars. You have Black Panther. You have Black-owned businesses carrying out authentic versions of their culture like braid businesses that are literally run by Black people as well. All of these are facets in society that you are able to look at and educate yourself and see the value of this culture and deem a particular group legitimate if you see that there is enough value in that culture as well. The second thing also that I think is 
that, that I think OG just doesn't want to engage with is our entire analysis to tell you that in the process of appropriation, appropriating a culture, you sanitize that versions of the culture. So you just get that right amount of shock value to look like you're an edgy person without necessarily delving into the meanings and the sort of definitional weight that, ca- that the culture carries with it. That's why you constantly see things like, for example, bindis being used in Coachella because, you know, Coachella is a time where you dress up and look gaudy and ostentatious, but you don't see white people on a day-to-day basis using a red dot in their forehead as a symbol of understanding that there's a cultural value behind the bindi. Similarly as well, you see people misusing braids and wearing blackface during Halloween, but never on a normal day wanting to become more tan and etc. Unless you are that weird... um, like white woman who wants to be black, which is an outlier, I would presume, in this entire case. For all these fronts, I think you only see white people continue to sanitize your culture in a way that gets them the edginess that they want, but not necessarily the values that they actually like like see in that culture. But the last thing is an even if, right? Even if they actually want to take their, your culture and use your culture, they can very really separate you as a community from your culture the yeah. second you give them the agency for them to do this. For, by God's sake, I think Americans freaking love Mexican food, but they refuse to go to like actual neighborhoods or me- where Mexicans live in because they are scared of gangs and they're scared of thugs. And therefore they have taco belled their entire fetish for Mexican culture without necessarily having to empower the communities where these cultures come from. I think specifically in, 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 in Malaysia as well, the Indian community, if you look at it, the ent- my entire life I was shamed for being Tamil and shamed for finding value in my own culture because I was deemed as the other and deemed as a weird person who follows a backwards culture of praying to statues. But right now I'm seeing people admiring my culture during the like festivities where they would use my, uh, my, uh, my cultural garments during festivities to say that this is beautiful, look at me, I, I, I look good in this culture without necessarily acknowledging the fact that these are individuals who have caused harm to the community and continue to cause harm in the community by appropriating these cultures and taking the ownership and agency away from these communities. That's why we argue to you that even if they do take this culture and intend to see value in it, they will see it in a way that removes removes the need for them to give you that dignity in that process. The second thing is this idea of microaggressions because apparently OG says that it's really difficult for us to constantly deal with like white people getting angry at us. They assume that the, the, the difficulties of dealing with the angry white people or microaggressions is more painful than the pain that you feel from seeing your culture being misrepresented constantly. I think there are two fronts on how you feel this pain. The first front is the fact that oftentimes this culture is misrepresented out of the context in which these cultures were born. So like much like I said earlier, the examples that I gave you as well, people oftentimes don't wear a sari to go to a temple, don't wear a sari to represent, go, go to like a like an Indian place in Malaysia. Rather, it's just used for like advertisements for, for example, beauty labels to just say, aha, hey, we have diversity and we have put a Malay person which is the majority group in Malaysia in a sari, which is the Indian minority costume to suggest that they have met representation quotas. Second thing also is to see the very same aggressors and individuals who perpetuate power dynamic imbalances and racial and social injustices use your culture specifically when you have not resolved things like, for example, like historical injustice, racial injustice and all baggages that have just been dismissed and brushed under the rug. Oftentimes, the only way in which communities feel like they are just and they can hold on to their identity and feel like they have not been constantly wrong is by making sure that people don't continue to misrepresent them, continue to weaponize their identities in a way that harms their own life. And lastly, I think with response to the cultural preservation idea, uh, I think cultural preservation is contingent upon you rightfully preserving that culture. I think in a world where we argue to you already, they say, higher likelihood of these these majority groups being able to sanitize your culture and bastardize your culture, we argue to that the cultural preservation is one that we don't want because we don't think it is actually inherently going to capture the the the, uh, the, uh, the essence of that culture. So for all these reasons, we argue to you that we have created a world where we allow a check and balance mechanism for minorities to feel some semblance of dignity, to feel some semblance of power in face of injustice that's continuing in their faces. For all these reasons, we tell you that minorities are best champion in the world of opening opposition. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition for their speech. I now invite the Member of Government to extend the case for side government. Here, here. Yo, am I audible? Visible? Everyone here? Nice. I can hear you. Awesome. Uh, Aditya, your internet's fine? Uh, come again? Aditya, your internet is okay, yes? Like... Uh, um, yeah, it, it's stable for now. Thankfully. Would you like for me to turn my video off is what I'm asking. Yes, please. Yeah, I thought so. All right. Uh, one second. 
Okay, if you're ready, panel, um, I'm starting my speech in three, two, one. Panel, the reason I asked my POI is because a lot of opening opposition's case is premised on this vague idea that appropriation is inherently wrong. They concede that minorities aren't a monolith, but then don't address the a fair amount of these minorities that don't mind like having their culture celebrated within the mainstream, right? Even if it is a diluted version of their culture. What like we bring to you on site closing government is going to be like on extensive matter. We first tell you that opening government didn't take this debate far enough, right? Like we'll tell you what the goals of these minority groups are, who holds social capital in society, and what the mechanism of this appropriation often is on extensive matter. But like when it comes to extraneous rebuttals, note that like the extent of opening opposition's analysis for why appropriation is wrong is just the words bastardization, like examples about why somehow Indians feel bad every time a Malay person wears a bindi, like without explaining why it is that like this feels wrong, outside of saying one anal analytical thing, saying that. It is uniquely ours, and that's how we derive value from our culture. On significant mitigation, we tell you on side closing government that, like, I don't derive culture, I don't derive utility from my culture only because it is unique to me. I am proud of my Indianness, or like, I enjoy yoga because it makes me flexible, or it it, it literally improves my health. I don't care if white people drink beer while they do yoga or do goat yoga separately. I still derive utility from my culture because of my innate authenticity and the pride that I have experienced just by living that culture. Yoga is that good for my health, regardless of goat yoga as a separate as a separate constructive. But on extensive matter, I'll tell you, like I go into who authenticity matters to separately, right? The rest and the rest of their constructive matter was largely concessionary in that they say that it is possible to for Kendrick Lamar to coexist even while Eminem does, right? Even if he is appropriating black culture by rapping. He, they, and like the final, the end of their constructive case was that, listen, this will be a stop gap to representation, which is to say that somehow if like we have token, like if Kunal Nair is in the Big Bang Theory and there's token Indian representation, somehow Sikhs are going to stop like attack, uh, stop like protesting the fact that they're being mistaken for Muslims or Pakistanis and shot, right? Or like lynched in the US. We, like, I don't think Black Lives Matter is likely to go away just because of cultural representation or like there's token black people in sitcoms, right? I don't know how that stop gap was analyzed to any real degree. On extensive matter, right? We tell you that like, yes, I think Asand mentality was a start of a case from OG. We'll complete it, right? Let me be very clear here. We think minority groups in status quo in the 21st century in 2020 today are facing existential crises, which is to say that with the right-wing xenophobic rise of governance, where the president of the United States of America, the leader of the free world, like characterizes Mexicans as rapists, as their Mexican immigrants as rapists, and or like in if Philippe Duterte like characterizes outsiders as people who deserve to be shot, we think in this world, like where in India, Muslims are scared to leave their households in Uttar Pradesh because you have a chief minister who openly says if one Indian Hindu gets kidnapped, I will kill 10 Muslim girls. The problem here is no longer about the purity of our culture. We think the minority group's goals then become, it isn't just us being identified as like authentic and pure and getting fair representation of the most pure version of our culture. I think far more important to these minorities in today's world is, this, is like assimilation and the seizing of discrimination, which is to say that when I enter a debate tournament, I've only like contemplated entering as debater X as opposed to Rudra, because not because I want to be recognized as an Indian in all of our Indian purity, but because I'm more worried about adjudicators possibly having inherent biases against Indian speakers in white tournaments, right? We think that like, this is the kind of, existential problem that minorities face. Like we think that opening opposition, while their goals are laudable, just aren't realistic as to like the serious problems that face minorities like in an existentially right-wing world today, right? We tell you that like even at best, we think their case, like because they haven't really explained outside of saying it's uniquely ours, why appropriation is bad. I think it's fair for us to then say that if closing does better, they'll say that it takes opportunity cost away from like people who should be represented in these media. Right, which is to say that, like, let's talk about Aloha. Right, uh, Emma Stone plays a Hawaiian lady despite having nothing to do with Hawaii. Right, Dwayne Johnson plays that uh, big muscular dude in Moana despite being born in California. Dakota Fanning plays like Lilo in Lilo and Stitch despite being having nothing to do with Hawaii. Right, we understand that this is problematic to the extent that like Hawaiian people aren't represented in these media, and that might take some amount of like 
caps, social and economic capital away from that. However, the alternative is these directors deciding not to produce these movies at all because these small minority groups, as Lupi like concedes in his speech, literally saying white people, uh, his first speaker says white people have money and they're not going to be altruistic. There's no reason for them to be nice to us. This is me quoting them verbatim. If that is the case, I don't see these movies ever getting made, right? So we think that like specifically the mechan, and we think once these movies are made, it sets the groundwork for future examples of like Anton Guzman or Lin-Manuel Miranda being able to succeed in a culture that is accepting of them, right? Because the people who hold these social capital as opening opposition tell us don't have incentive to include us within this conversation. We think specifically like being including in this con included in this conversation in the mechanism in which we are included, right? Given that the alternative is us being painted as snake charmers as Indian, I'd rather them wear saris and bindis because that right now, the problem I'm facing as an Indian is that H1B visas to America are being shut down because Trump is implementing like a Muslim ban to certain states. I can't get to America. I don't mind you wearing a, like a bindi. I think Trump's calling Mexicans rapists like is strongly undercut if he eats a burrito on camera after, right? It gives us something to point to. It points to the validity of what we bring to the table. Sure, bro, I'll take O. Um, why does any of the benefits you're suggesting, such as a reduced form of racism occur when the DPM suggests that you can separate the person from the culture, i.e. can love the culture but still hate the people? Because you didn't sufficiently prove that you can separate the culture from the person. Which is to say that if the Britishers eat, sell and eat naan bread, right, across the world, like we think that them participating with our food, and I think OG proves this to a sufficient extent, that amount of participation at least marginally increases our ability to like be a part of this mainstream culture that is celebratory, right? We are on their dining tables. They have to acknowledge that. And like we think there's significant opportunity cost of, to condemnation as well, right? Which is to say that once they start selling naan bread as a minority, we have one of two options. Note that we have limited airtime as is, right? It isn't very often that you'll see an Indian on BBC. So once we are on, like once we do have this limited airtime, we can either say, hey, look, that food that you're celebrating and eating, that came from our home, right? And then we can leverage that into inclusion or we can say, stop eating our food and like buy into this xenophobic rhetoric of us and them that OG brings to you, right? We tell, we tell you that like while OO's examples were entertaining, they fail spectacularly at telling you why this appropriation is inherently wrong because I don't derive culture, like I don't derive utility from my culture because it's exclusive. I derive utility from my culture because I am proud of having been brought up in it and I don't know why necessarily I should mind other people celebrating it, especially when it's celebrated in a world in which otherwise people are incredibly xenophobic. For all these reasons, we stand incredibly proud to propose. Cool. Everyone ready? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Brilliant. I'm going to begin by dealing with closing government. Closing government's claim is that when your, when your culture is shared more broadly in society, it gives you greater power in that society through which you are able to achieve other aims. And the example they give is when Trump eats a burrito, it makes it easier for Mexicans in America to assert themselves as having some status in that country. We have broadly two responses to this. The first response is, is that this entire government bench does not consider the counterfactual that I point out in a point of information from the beginning of the debate, which is twofold. Firstly, on our side of the house, we can still defend a world in which minority groups allow majority groups to come to their culture under conditions, which means all of the harms that this government bench describes of participation in culture are significantly mitigated because you still get participation in culture. It is just participation that comes with terms. But the second note that we will make uniquely from closing opposition is that this debate does not occur in a context in which minority groups are overwhelmingly powerful and have the ability to entirely stop majoritarian groups from culturally appropriating them. But minority groups do have a certain amount of power by which they can instill cautiousness into majoritarian groups. And what that means is, is that it is still likely on either side of the house that you will have some degree of mass produced burritos. The difference is, is when one side of the house has to defend mass produced burritos that have the go ahead to act in an insensitive way, whereas on our side of the house, we can still capture the benefits of participation, but with a greater degree of sensitivity. The second response we have to closing government is just that the claim that Trump eating a burrito associate him, associates him with Mexicanness is mistaken 
for the reason that when you appropriate cultures, they become involved into broader majoritarian culture. So burritos are not seen as distinctly Mexican, but instead part of American culture, which is the reason why you don't get the expression of appreciation of culture, but instead the absorption of culture into a greater, more harmful, homogenous mass. That deals with most of government bench. Now, let's move on to the novel part of our extension. Closing government asks a question to opening opposition that they cannot answer, which is this. How do white people eat doing goofy yoga, how does that stop minorities from being able to access their own culture? And the problem is, is that if opening opposition can't resolve this question, they cannot win the debate. Because their claim is, is that culture is the most important thing in this debate, but they do not answer why it is the case that it harms your own access to culture merely that it enables other people to access your culture in negative ways. Our claim from closing opposition is that when you allow for cultural appropriation, it does stop your ability to access your own culture for two reasons. Firstly, it creates a collective action problem whereby you don't have internal community pressure that stops you from selling out your own culture. And secondly, it creates strong business incentives to sell out your own culture, which means the guardians of your culture are far less likely to preserve it and instead, you lose it entirely. And the important piece of framing for this point is that cultural practice is a learned thing. It does not exist universally on either side of the house. So if your own minority group is unwilling to teach and engage in an authentic form of cultural practice, that means your own group is able to learn it. Let's go into a little bit more depth. Our claim is that this, shifts, this shift in norms would encourage groups to sell out their own cultural practice. The first reason here is that it causes a collective action problem because at the moment, each individual practitioner of a cultural practice from a minority group has an incentive to engage in the most commercial form of practice, which is to say they have an incentive to make it really diluted, to sell it out to white people and take away the important, meaningful cultural elements of it. The reason they do not is because they experience significant cultural backlash if they do participate in that form of cultural practice. When the group as a whole does not put that cultural backlash on you, it generates the collective action problem, whereby no longer does any individual practitioner have the incentive to not be the actor who sells out their own culture, which means that you get millions upon millions of cultural practitioners who are now in a race to the bottom to dilute their culture such that they can be the one to capture the market because they know that other individuals would otherwise do it in this circumstance. The second reason here is because it puts enormous business pressure on each individual business that practices cultural pressure to, in another race to the bottom, dilute their own culture. And this material is particularly important in a context of financial need that these minority communities are often in, which means that they often have to trade off important cultural value for money wherein they are in circumstances where they have very little money, right? Two reasons here. First reason here is because that you generate competition with non-community practitioners, which is to say that if you are an African-American practitioner of film and now Disney is more emboldened to engage in the kind of art that you sell, you now have to compete with Disney which means you have to compete with them on similar terms, which means you are less likely to be an authentic practitioner of your own culture. The second reason here is that you get internal community competition, as I explained in the first point with respect to the collective action problem that is generated, which means that the overwhelming financial incentive for any authentic guardians of culture is to sell out their own culture, which means that internally within these community groups, it is much, much harder to access authentic expressions of culture. I'll take opening government. Your model where people can participate with some terms is status quo. And that's moot because it's only targeted to people that are already liberal and educated, which isn't a problem in the debate. Uh, no. So the first thing to note is that it does not target people who are already liberal and educated. And the reason that you know that is because uh, people still like engaging with that cultural practice. But major corporations, for fear of pissing off liberals, are unlikely to offer that, which means if they want to engage with it, they have to only access cultural practitioners who are authentic in the status quo. That is the reason that POI doesn't make sense. And the strong example of the point that we are making is that this has happened in the past. For example, in Australia, the Vietnamese community had the incentive to try to assimilate as much as possible. And as a corollary, there is no authentic Vietnamese food that the Vietnamese community nowadays can access because Vietnamese people do not engage and authentic practice in that regard. The last thing I'm going to do in the speech is briefly deal with opening government. Opening government's claim is that this generates an us versus them narrative. 
The first line of response that we have is that the idea that this inherently does so is absurd for four reasons. Firstly, because it is good to have some degree of us versus them such that you establish boundaries. They don't explain why us versus them is inherently bad or would take the form that is bad. Secondly, actors who perceive the us versus them narrative to emerge in the face of the pointing out of cultural practices are likely to be racist anyway, so it is symmetric. Thirdly, white people still otherize you when they dress up as you for Halloween, so it's unclear why engaging in your practice in a negative way doesn't create an us versus them narrative. And finally, the other claim, which is just that minority groups will be hostile in their call-outs, is just hugely infantilizing of these groups, and they do not substantiate why they would be likely to act in the most negative way possible. That is the reason why opening government cannot win this debate. That is the reason why closing opposition will win this debate. I thank the member of opposition for their speech and I invite the government whip for their speech. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Chair. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Just give me a second. Hi, I'm really sorry for the delay. Just give me a second. I'll be doing my pizza. All right, uh, panel, I hope I'm audible. Could I get a confirmation on the same? Yes, you are. Cool, um, yeah, three, two, one. As a Muslim Shia man in India, I'm tired of inauthentic representation. I get in one movie per year out of the 5,000 movies that are produced by Bollywood every damn year. The idea of guarding my culture then necessarily doesn't ever create any kind of organic dissemination and acceptance in the state which kills and vilifies these minorities, not because they just hate them, but because it feeds on the fear of a majority which always feels that these, this minority is mystic and you can never understand who they are because of lack of knowledge, information, and organic understanding in culture. Let's deal with Seal. Seal's argumentation is that the case is that minorities should be held hostage on their culture for the fear of backlash. We don't agree on this for three major reasons, right? Firstly, we don't think like access of culture to myself as a minority does not go away at any point of time, just because I dilute it to a certain sense to make it say at, at worst palatable to the general audiences. Right? Why do we think so? We feel that an individual by the courtesy of their lived experiences shared culture, family, upbringing, remembrance of history of a partition or a break or, or an independence movement or understanding of things such as Holocaust which have marred their communities in the past necessarily remember and are always the custodians of what the authenticity of this culture is and holds in at the end of the day. We feel then further, we feel even like that like minuscule like Trump eating burrito example is important because at worst also, it's some kind of cultural celebration compared to the condemnation and vilification that this community necessarily has to face on the larger sense at all points of time. We don't understand that even in like business pressures, how minorities in themselves would be inauthenticated because these majorities that like 
say all of opposition talks about the only reason they're opting into these cultures is because of the want and need to like understand that culture in itself i e that is if i go to an indian restaurant in us i necessarily go to to like experience some kind of indian food because that is what i want out of the same at all points of times right on that idea like let's then talk about what is oos case at that point of time right? they feel that like their their whole principle and argumentation necessarily stems from this understanding that there exists some harm as soon as this like this appropriation is done at any point of time and this culture is disseminated into masses right the manifestation of this harm however is something that they never really are able to tell you except for some niche singular examples of my emotions getting hurt right for example their case stems from the idea of appropriation of say hijab maybe by individuals as fashion statements right and that they feel is extremely problematic we don't disagree right however the problem is that at for all points of times in major say arab nations and like other nations which have like significant muslim populations also hijab is also seen as a fashion statement in say touristic like senses by muslims themselves today right where they culturally go on to like own their own culture and be proud of it and present it in the ways they want at all points of time they feel that when there isn't organic dissemination and understanding and a certain minority is like vilified they look for pointers of acceptance at all points of times where they get some kind of cushions of representation and understanding by the majority in that state at all points of time we feel that all of their argumentation necessarily gives like some kind of cushion and hope and understanding to these minorities because now they understand that whatever their culture was which was historically seen as problematic is now given some understanding and like is is like better off at that point of time we feel that when that happens there is a higher propensity of normalization and acceptance of knowledge that happens because of say even in like their best case scenario we would feel that like situation such as a show like rami which is considered extremely authentically egyptian by say white people might not be considered so by the community of egyptians in us themselves at any point of time because they might have problems with the same that is where like the argumentation about fragments existing in minorities comes to the fore right that is regardless of what your presentation is the propensity of it being extremely authentic and the most authentic form never really exists however at all points of times that like that acceptance only comes in this organic dissemination of that culture we feel gatekeeping then and something that og points out but never pushes forward to you is creates misconceptions because of no knowledge that like leads to a lack of dignity in the life of these individuals at all points of time before i come to like telling you why our distinctive matter wins i'll take closing So the problem with your claim that these groups will always know their cultural practice because they have memories of it is that each individual does not have some access to the shared cultural memory sure, is sure. only kept alive think, through traditions. Yeah, thank you. I think at worst also then also there is some understanding of where you come from. That is even if I'm a second generation Australian growing up like an Indian Australian growing up in Australia and my parents were migrants or even if my grandparents are migrants there are memories of their families who stayed back in India. or the culture of food they have which necessarily always stays inside my house which is authentic at all points of time that i can always opt into or remember or have some cultural pointers towards at all points of time we feel these minorities at worst also that is like co's best case also are way more authentic as like cultural custodians who can push for like narratives of their cultures at all points of time whereas our case right? we tell you two things which take this debate a what are the goals of the minority culture and what are these mecha- mechanisms of like inclusion at all points of time through which these goals are achieved we feel firstly there exists an existential crisis out there for these minorities because they have no voice and are forced to hide their identities in status quo that as as a muslim man i never feel safe putting a skull cap and going out to pray at any point of time because i feel that i'd be identified and attacked at all points of time we feel that like when there's assimilation and organic discourse with like all individuals knowing more about my culture that's not like marred with like misinformation and like different ideas of what it is because we're gatekeepers of the same we feel then there can be like better idea of what like what what is to be pushed at that point of time and that knowledge in itself exists the mechanisms of inclusion can create normalized culture under those circumstances which can further create participation as in like rudra's speech in terms of pushing forward this idea that regardless that you might like 
draw out different derivations of like yoga or like food out of my culture at any point of time you necessarily are still opting into some part of it which necessarily disseminated from my authentic idea of it at all points of time we feel when that like authentic idea is at all pushed forward creates a better conversation creates a better life for us because now it's part of the mainstream at all points of times and it's still ours today we've never been prouder to perform I thank the government whip for their speech and I invite the opposition whip to conclude the case for side opposition thank you You can hear me okay Yes you can In a world where minority communities do not feel pressure to uh preserve their culture because they've changed the norms in terms of saying well now it's fine for majorities to access this culture in any way they see fit that means you actually do get lost access in the long term because you no longer gatekeep and you also have to compete with uh majoritarian businesses who have basically just been endorsed uh to to you know take this culture in any way they see fit that is the unique material that we explain from ceo we fill in the access point in this debate and that's why we win so i'm going to do three things in this speech firstly i'm going to step through that uh, and whip our extension in a bit more detail before kind of dealing with i guess what is the main prongs of the cg extension uh, as well as the opening government case and why we get up over both so firstly Let's look at our extension because at, up until this point, there's a bit of a problem in the debate. In so far as it's unclear as to how these groups actually lose their own access, because at most it's proven that maybe majorities bastardize the culture in a problematic way, but perhaps minorities can still preserve their culture in a way that they see fit. But it's also a bit unclear, you know, to what extent majorities will probably do what they want on either side of this debate. Like they don't really need the endorsement of minority communities to take their culture. So what we provide is the gap, which is how this changes internally within those communities and how this means that culture gets lost. And Oli explains to you a couple of important reasons. The first is because under the status quo, there is currently a norm, which is we must preserve. the you know how our culture looks in in its kind of original manifestation right and the reason you do that is as a signaling effect to say to minority majority communities uh this is you know this is important and therefore you should not take that uh now when you're basically saying to those majorities oh well it's fine there's no internal pressure within that community to completely change the way in which you might run a restaurant or a yoga studio or anything else right that is the first thing we say the second thing we say is that to the extent that to you are providing some signaling effect to majority companies and majority businesses and any other form of majority in society to the extent that they now feel that they can take you know take parts of that culture more now you have to compete with them you have to compete with them in so far as you know to preserve you know the very profits that cg i uh, think they can make um because obviously to the extent that there is some demand in the market majorities typically make up the majority of the population and they dictate that what does cg say in response to this they say firstly well even if you're diluting the culture the culture is still there right what's the big issue well we actually say that dilution of culture is particularly significant like if your restaurant dish tastes nothing like the dish that your parents made and then someone doesn't have the ability to then access that of course like oh it's still butter chicken no like if it tastes nothing alike then of course that is a dilution we ought to care about then they say Ah, uh, but there's still the memory of that that original practice, right? But I think this is vastly overestimating the extent to that exists. Like minority communities don't just like upload all their practices on a website. That that information gets lost in time. But even if the information is there, the fact is that that the norm around whether you engage with that thing vastly changes. So minority communities cannot access that culture in a way that is meaningful to a vast number of people. Maybe at best, business owners are okay with making those decisions for those communities, but they generally sit like a top of that hierarchy in those communities. It is unfair for the people who have the most wealth and the most resources in that society to say to every other minority in that community that they no longer 
or to access their culture. So that is the most important material in this debate and why we win. Before I deal with some of the other issues in this debate, I will take a POI from closing government. Do you genuinely think that if you play Mr. Khan on BBC for a while and lie about how inclusive the UK is of Muslims, like the Muslims will forget a partition that killed more people than the Holocaust over time? Oh, that's great, because I'm going to deal with your extension right now and directly respond to that question. So your point just seems to be that this undercuts uh, racism uh, in communities, and that is good. I think uh, Oli provides a number of good responses to this. I'll add a couple more. The first observation I make is that I think you just make it worse, because now Donald Trump can say, well, I've eaten a burrito. I cannot possibly hate Mexican people. I love their culture, right? Allowing those majorities to do that just basically gives them an out, which I think is extremely problematic. But also, as Ollie explains to you, uh, now you're just, when, when you say that culture is mainstream, a burrito, for example, no longer becomes a unique Mexican artifact. It is just part of the mainstream. So therefore, there is no association to that thing in such a way that that would, you know, signal acceptance of, of that culture. So that's the first prong of CG's extension, and I think is very nicely dealt with by those responses. The second prong of CG's extension is just to say that uh, this is good because now you can profit off your culture to the extent that you get more mainstream kind of take up of that thing. You can now enter into that market in a way that's really good. The problem with that, though, is that unfortunately, in most cases, majority communities and businesses will always have the structural advantages such that they benefit from the pro proliferation of that culture, right? Like the reality is white businesses and, you know, individuals with more power have more access to capital in terms of propping up their business. They have more access to access to political structures. So in almost all circumstances, the, the dissemination of that culture in ma majority spaces will just mean that the businesses you want to profit on your side just get priced out. But uh, even if there are some, you know, businesses in minority communities that are doing okay under your policy, they are likely to be the most privileged within that community. So I think that's the CG extension dealt with. Let's quickly look at opening because they have, uh, again, this notion of understanding of culture, right? The problem with this, as Oli explains, is we're not saying you can never, ever access these cultures. Pro opponents of cultural appropriation do not say that. They simply say you ought to engage with us. There should be some reciprocity and you should do it in a way that is authentic. The implications of this are, one, it is achievable to have that conversation. Two, in a lot of cases, you don't make white people angry in the way that governments say. And three, even if you get uh, slightly less people accessing, at least those that do, do this in a good way. The final thing to say is, uh, you know, you get some sort of internal validation. I don't think minorities need this. I think they can be proud of their culture without the approval of majorities, but nor should we be encouraging a norm that that should be the case for all of these reasons. So proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the opposition whip for a speech. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the debate. Please give us a while to deliberate and we'll get back to you with the feedback shortly, I hope. Uh, before that, just leave the room and we'll call you once we're done. Thank you.